Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome. I am very delighted that one of my very favorite people in this whole world, <laughs> Father Michael Witt. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Teresa. Great to get back. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to have you in this chair. I can't tell you how much I have been anticipating it, but I know as well all of our listeners because I get comments everywhere I go about the shows. Everybody loves them and just absolutely adores listening to church history with you as our instructor. We are beginning today, mm-hmm. from the beginning, at in, the in beginning. a sense, yeah. we are going back to early church history. We are going to look at the 12 generations, a history of the early church. Yeah. Why don't I just give you a second to just give us maybe an overview of, of what we are going to be doing? Okay. Uh, this time six months ago, I had no idea. <laughs> Uh, I was very fortunate the seminary uh, gave me a sabbatical, and I took my study week and added to that and some vacation time added to that. And so I basically took uh, about 40, 45 uh, books from church history, early church history, uh, the early church fathers, and just read those uh, day and night, getting up early in the morning, reading seven, eight hours a day. And then after about four and a half months, I started taking walks in the woods with Northland, the black lab, and I had these aha moments. And one of them was one way of of taking this whole period of church history uh, apart is to look at it from generations, each generation 40 years old, okay, 40 years. And so that comes down to 12 generations. It brings us right up to the beginning of our medieval period Mm -hmm. that we had recorded earlier with the Merovingians. And so... That's what we're going to do, and today, actually, we're going to start at the end of the first generation, 70 A.D., so we're clocking this from the resurrection around 30 A.D., 70 A.D., and then after looking at the siege of Jerusalem, uh, there's some really neat little morsels there, and so then we'll go back, back to Jerusalem before the time of Christ, and then bring ourselves up. And then from there, we'll be pretty chronological going on from generation to generation. And and when we complete this session, which yes. we figure about 48 shows. There are about 48 we, shows, yeah. Then we will have completed 170 programs. Yeah. 171 programs. Yeah, that's right. We'll be going from basically um, the... the um, Herod the Great, all the way up to the last year of John Paul II. Now, but we also did American church history. We did, but I think we lost those. I uh, think we did, unfortunately. (laughs) But I mean, I think there may be a few that hang around somewhere. I'm not sure where they all are, but I I would like we'd like to see what we can do to find those. But so really, we've done we will have done more than that. But this is what we have in in the. That we have that we have restored that we can get a hold of and right and these are exciting. on CDs right. uh, they're in people's hands uh, they're on your website they're on my website uh, they're on MP3 files uh, so and they're, they're circulating around and, and being used I think uh, by a lot of people I think I think they are and I every once in a while run into a deacon who'll tell me <laughs> or a deacon in training who'll yeah. tell me I'm listening to you <laughs> like, That's don't right. listen to me just listen to Father. <laughs> Anyway, so I don't want to take too much time because I know we have we have a great program today. But okay. it is so good to have you back. Thanks. <laughs> so well, one of the uh, fun things uh, in in reading uh, widely into into church history and not just church history but also secular history, military history, diplomatic history of all of this of this period is that you come up with some very interesting little fun facts and and uh, little snippets that. Um, that give you insights, and that's why I'm starting in 70 A.D., because I came across an interesting incident that took place during the siege of Jerusalem, and um, so that's why I want to start there, Okay. and then we'll just weave this thing all the way through. Sounds okay. wonderful. You know the Roman army had various uh, kinds of artillery that was available to it, and each legion was given several pieces of, um, of artillery, sometimes as many as ten, and, and they varied in size. And they were they they were catapults. We're, we're familiar with the catapulta. Mm-hmm. 
the uh, uh, Caro Ballista, the Onagar, uh, which which fired off a great big huge stone. Uh, it's actually Latin for wild donkey, <laughs> ah. so it had quite a kick to it. And then other kinds of ballista. And the ranges differed and the projectiles varied. But one that was of interest was uh, noted by the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. We'll be using him a lot in, in all of this. He's actually about the only source we have. Um, that's definitive on on, on these uh, um, on this siege. Um, he spoke about the tenth legion, which was one of the Roman legions that had attacked Jerusalem. It was sieging it from the east. It was set up on the Mount of Olives, if you could imagine. Hmm. So 40 years earlier, that Mount of Olives was a very, very different place. Yes. Now it's the bivouac for the 10th Legion, and they were using one of their projectiles, one of their ballista. Uh, he simply calls it a stone projector. At a range of about a quarter of a mile, they would fire this like catapult off, okay? And it would hurl a boulder that was a stone that um, Josephus said was about a talent in weight. So somewhere between 75 and 85 pounds, Quarter now, of a mile. Quarter of a mile. Now, that stone would not be strong enough to do any real damage against those walls in Jerusalem. Those were fantastic walls. And so there had to be another reason why they were doing that, and what it was was anti-personnel. The idea is that you fire that stone high enough and you hit a tower or you hit a, a wall, it shatters, and the uh, the shrapnel then come down and it'll rain down on the people below and injure them or kill them. And so as a result of that, some of the um, some of the soldiers, uh, the the, uh, the Jewish soldiers, were sent to those walls in watchtowers, and they were assigned the duty of shouting out because they could see this, the ballista is about to be fired. When the ballista was fired, they would shout out. They were told to shout out, "The stone is coming." The stone oh. is coming. Okay? Okay, okay. Now, the Hebrew word for stone, of course, is aben. Aben, right? Mm -hmm. As the stone would be coming, they would shout out, the ben is coming. Not the aben is coming, but the ben is coming. Ben is Hebrew for the sun, mm -hmm. S-O-N. Oh, my God. They were mocking the Christians about the second coming. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that something? I think one of the things that's really important in that little story is that it, it tells us that even as early as 70 A.D., there was already an expectation of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, sometimes in that era that we lived through in the 1960s and early 1970s and even the 50s, there was such a de demythification of, um, of the scriptures. Yes. And, and as a result... We ended up with this thing that, well, you can't rely on scriptures. Um, they, they were not written until the early 2nd century. All the, Bull, excuse me, but here we have an incident, and we, we're not even going to a, a Christian source. These are Jewish soldiers who know the Christian message and are mocking the Christians for it. So I think it's just a, a wonderful story for us to uh, uh, to look at. Right. If they did that, that shows how widespread that's it had, be, had to become. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And that's just 40 years after the right. event itself. Um, there's been a, a secular reading on this uh, in, in the footnote. In fact, in Josephus's uh, The Jewish Wars, it says at the bottom that they were actually saying Sonny's coming huh. as a nickname. That doesn't make any sense. Right. You know. So anyway, take that for what it's worth. Right. I think it's a mockery of Christianity. Oh, it's an I insult. I think that's right. Now, uh, the Christians are not there, and next time around we come back, uh, I'm going to give you some um, pretty solid evidence as to where they went. And we already know why, and all you have to do is read Scripture to know this. Now, whether or not uh, Luke's Gospel was written down at this point, 70 A.D. or not, uh, that's pretty. Um, that's up for the question. Uh, but, but certainly the, um, the words of Jesus had been memorized and had the oral traditions had already um, been uh, in circulation. We know this for a fact, and again, I think I'll be able to show this. And so, definitely, when um, when the uh, Roman armies came in to surround Jerusalem in 69 and 70 A.D., these are the words that were in the Christians' ears. Listen to this. This is Luke's Gospel, the uh, uh, 21st chapter, 20th verse and following. 
when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and I'll show you if we have time, I'll show you exactly where those legions were. They had Jerusalem surrounded. Know that the desolation is at hand. And boy, what a desolation. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Okay, so if you're in Judea, in other words, the surrounding country, go to the mountains. Uh, Let those within the city escape from it which is exactly what they end up doing, and let those in the countryside not enter the city. Now, in other words, what would have been happening is the Christians would have been streaming out at the very same time that the Jews in the neighborhoods, in the, in the, uh, in the countryside, would have been streaming in. Okay. okay? Um, for these days are coming a time of punishment when all of the scriptures are fulfilled. Woe to the pregnant woman and the nursing mothers in those days, for the terrible calamity will come upon the earth and a wrathful judgment upon this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be taken as captives to all the Gentiles, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Uh, When we go through Josephus and his description of the siege, those words... That, that are predicted by Jesus, uh, those those words ringing in the ears of the Christians are fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's that, that, there you go. <laughs> um, one word of caution about Josephus: um, he is the only source we have, and that's also often true in ancient history. We only sure. use, we're lucky to have two mm-hmm. uh, corroborators, but in, in this case, we only have the one, and uh, so we have to rely on him. We have to rely on the logic of what he's saying, whether this makes sense or not. We have to rely on the archaeology and the uh, geography uh, to oh. look for corroboration. And by and large, we find it. But we have to understand two other things about uh, Josephus. One is he is a an uncontrollable braggart. Okay. He will, and I'll show you a little bit later on. He thinks he's the hottest thing going. <laughs> and the second thing is he is a an uncontrollable brown nose. Uh, he, his um, his patron is is going to be uh, the general Titus, and boy, is he going to paint Titus nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping that in mind, those are our, that he's our source. Um, you know, oftentimes big events get started by some little trigger somewhere. Um, I think back on the German peasant revolts of the 1500s. It was started because of strawberries. Um, the uh, Paris riots of 18, uh, 1789 that led to the French Revolution. There was a bread shortage. Mm-hmm. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, this past summer in Burma. Uh, the government thought they would uh, do a quickie and they double the price of gasoline overnight and you ended up with all those riots and and uh, and protests and and so many monks uh Buddhist monks right. involved in that so those things happen the case of the Jewish war um, that ranged from 66 AD to 70 AD a bird it was a bird it happens not in Jerusalem but at the port city of Caesarea Maritana and there's a synagogue there. There's a significant Jewish population there, although it's a Gentile city. It was built by Herod the Great, uh, honoring Caesar. But uh, anyway, there, there were Jews there. And in this one synagogue, um, the the elders of the synagogue were concerned that the synagogue itself was uh, was standing on property that was rather precarious in the sense that it was not owned by the uh, uh, the community itself, oh, okay. and so they went to a uh, a Greek who owned the lot directly in front of the synagogue and offered to buy the lot so they would have a nice entrance to the uh, the synagogue. Well, the Greek decided he was going to have some fun, and he raised the price real high and in the end, the community said hey we 're not going to pay that it 's not worth that much so then what he did was he then leased the property out and they set up some um little workshops, little wooden workshops, right in front of the synagogue, so that there was a, there was a, uh, um, a little walkway that the, the Jews would have to go through in order to get into their synagogue. And um, so that's, that's bad enough. They started this little causeway, this little right-of-way getting in. And, of course, they were not happy about that. Well, then one day, as they were coming to worship, there was a man sitting right next to that causeway and he had taken a pot and he turned it upside down and he was sacrificing a bird 
to some god. Now, that's the ultimate insult. And, well, you had some uh, young hotheads among the synagogue members, and uh, they went over and they beat the man up. And his friends came over to defend him, and they beat their friends up too. And so there was a little tussling that went back and forth. The Romans intervened, and when they did, they uh, they came in, they took a real quick look at what was happening and, and the pro- provocation involved, and they sided with the Jews. Okay. And so they did not press charges against these um, the young toughs that had beaten up this this guy and his bird, and um, but nonetheless. The, the Jewish community was so upset with this experience that they looked around and they found another location seven miles away, and they bought that property. Their intention was to build a synagogue there and simply move out of the neighborhood. So uh, that, was, that was the idea. They also sent a delegation to the, the local procurator over this area in order to protest what had happened to them and who knows, maybe to get some funding or something. So they sent some of their leadership down to Florus. He was now the procurator. He's, he was one of the descendants of, of uh, Pontius Pilate. And he was staying at that time at Sebaste. Okay. And so they presented to him the, um, the, um, uh, their, their protest. He's not the best man to go to. And unfortunately, the procurators of Judea um, had a, pretty bad reputation in history as being not not the brightest candles in the candelabra and and that was certainly true with him uh he got his position because his wife was a friend of the empress um this is pompeia in 65 AD, he received the uh, position. So he had just been in, involved. Uh, he just re- uh, arrived shortly before that. He had replaced a man by the name of Al- Albinus, um, who was governor there. He was absolutely terrible. And when he left, he freed most of the prisoners from the jails on bribes, yeah. which he took himself personally. <laughs> okay. so these guys are just, you know, <laughs> well, Flores wasn't a heck of a lot better. And now, actually, when you go back to it, it's, things had been seething for about 60 years because Pontius Pilate wasn't terribly popular either. These were money mongers. They uh, were open to bribes. They used extortion. At one point, uh, Flores actually raided the temple treasury. Now, that's a very important thing. The temple treasury was money that was collected by, by way of a tithe all throughout the um, uh, Israel, Mm -hmm. and that money was taken in, and that money would be used then for the temple uh, purposes, and then also it took care of widows and orphans, Mm -hmm. you know, so this was big stuff, and occasionally, rarely, but occasionally, uh, temple uh, treasuries were raided, and here's a case in which uh, he did that. He, um, He came in and basically extorted 17 talents. Now, we don't know whether these are talents of gold or talents of silver, but remember a talent weighs 75 pounds? Wow. I figured out that silver, uh, I did this calculation based on 2005. Okay. Uh, Okay. At $7.60 an ounce, we're looking at over $110,000, just that one rate. If they were gold talents at $600 an ounce, We'd be looking at twelve million two hundred and forty thousand dollars. Oh my God! Now it might be a combination somewhere in between, mm-hmm. but at least a hundred thousand dollars was taken out of that treasury, and probably a significant amount more. So that's that's who these guys are dealing with. So what does he do instead? He decides there were some street demonstrations also in Jerusalem supporting the uh, uh, the Jewish community at, at uh, Caesarea. And so he sends troops to Jerusalem, you know, it's a show of force. He's got something else going on here, too. To tell you the truth, Floris wants to have a fight. Oh, okay. Because if he can have a fight, then he can get in there and, and, and literally raid the city and steal things. Mm-hmm. You know, so he sends the troops in. The citizens don't rise to the bait. What they did instead was they went out and greeted the troops as liberators. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was Jewish humor, Jewish <laughs> irony. It was so good, and of course he was not happy about that. So what he did was he started looking around for the ringleaders of this little 
group that had oh, you know no. had done that, and uh, they weren't turned over. Mm-hmm. So now that you know, he had his excuse, and what he did then was he sent troops into the upper markets uh, in in Jerusalem, and um, later on I'll describe a little bit about how we can look at Jerusalem as a clock, but uh, basically we're looking at the like the nine o'clock part of, of the city. 3,600 people were killed or crucified as a result of this little raid. Oh, my God. Things were were barreling out of control, and there was one individual who came in to try to calm things down, and this was Queen Bernice. She's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, by the way. Uh, she and her her brother consort, uh, King Agrippa II. Now, King Agrippa is, happens to be in Egypt at the time, so he's he's out of the kingdom and he's not able to appeal to Florus to stop this stuff. So Queen Bernice goes to him herself, stands before him barefooted, as a sign of supplication, uh-huh. you know, and pff, he ignores it. He wants that fight. Well. Word gets up to Antioch, which is the provincial capital of that entire part of the Roman Empire. And uh, up in Antioch, the the big enchilada up there is a guy by the name of Cestius Gallus. And he's concerned about things getting out of control. So he sends a tribune down to Jerusalem to, uh, down to Jerusalem to investigate. This is a man by the name of... uh, um, Neopolitan, Neopolitan, I'm sorry, Neopolitanos. And uh, as he's moving down, as he's going down from Antioch, he comes across um, King Agrippa, who has just landed in Jam, uh, at uh, Joppa, uh, I'm sorry, Jamnia. And the two of them meet there. And at the, it's at this point that some Jewish delegations come out. And these are priests and leaders come out from Jerusalem to Jamnia to meet with um, Neopolitanos and King Agrippa and to present their case against Florus. Well, um, what happens then is that Neopolitanos makes his way down to Jerusalem. Now Florus is uh, he's laying low, let's say, because <laughs> this guy's here to investigate. And he knows he's in, in trouble because Neopolitanus then goes to the temple, and he, he can only go as far as the, as the court of the Gentiles, but in the court of the Gentiles, he worships the God of Israel. Wow. So that did an awful lot to uh, calm people in, um, uh, in Jerusalem. However, there are a lot of other rabble-rousers on the other side who are still interested in getting stuff going, and there's one group that actually attacked the Roman garrison at Masada, which is this great fortress that um, um, that uh, Herod had built, and they slaughtered the entire Roman garrison there. Now, we're going to see these guys a little bit later on. Um, also, in Jerusalem, not everybody's happy with making peace with the Romans. There are a number of people who are thinking, hey, this is our time. Let's go for it. And one of those happens to be the son of the high priest. Of the, uh, um, this is, uh, the, the high priest is Ananias, and this, his son's name is Eleazar. Okay. Okay. Um, he convinces several of the priests that in their worship that they should not pray for the health of the emperor. Now, it's been a common thing for many, many years that the that the uh, the Jews were allowed to practice their own faith, but they promised also to pray for the emperor. He convinces them not to pray for the emperor. So okay. you see, there's there's some pushing and pulling uh, right. back and forth and all of this, and and so this is um, this is the revolutionary party in Jerusalem itself. It is set against the chief priests and the Pharisees who are trying to work things out with the Romans. And at this point, then, Agrippa, King Agrippa, sends 2,000 Jewish soldiers to Jerusalem in order to maintain some control, because it's obvious whenever a Roman soldier appears, there's a lot of tension. That's, mm-hmm. you know, so he's, he's hoping to solve this with some 2,000 uh, Jewish cavalry. Now, for seven days, when Agrippa's troops arrive... For seven days, there is a running battle in the streets between King Agrippa's Jewish troops and these these Jewish um, revolutionaries. 
And at, at this point, even uh, King Agrippa's palace is burned. Uh, his residence is burned. The public archives are looted. Wow. That was a smart move because at the public archives, that's where they kept all of the bonds of credit. Oh. <laughs> 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 and there was no redundancy, yeah. so that was one way of wiping out your debt. <laughs> I didn't have a loan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, loan. What loan? <laughs> and uh, so when, what happens then is then the battle goes on to the Antonia, which is one, that that great uh, palace, and that raged on for almost two days. Also, um, by this time there is one rebel. Uh, his name is Mahenna. He's the one who had led the rebels to slaughter the Roman troops at Masada. And his father had been a rebel even at the time of Christ. Okay, wow. so we're going back 30 years. His father was a was a rabble rouser mm-hmm. uh, even uh, even at that time and had been a, um, uh, a bandit. Well, Mahenna then takes his his rebels that had taken Masada, and he goes to Jerusalem too. So it's like everything's converging on Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. When he arrives, he's all dressed up in the robes of King Herod the Great. He takes over much of the city. Um, he offers safe passage to the troops to leave Jerusalem, but only the Jewish troops. Okay. At this point, they decided it was better to get out than stay, mm-hmm. and they abandoned their Roman allies. Wow. And so the Romans are there by themselves. They then retreated to three towers. They, so they were bro- they broke their troops up into three towers, and there they were being besieged. Um, along these lines, while this is happening, the high priest himself, um, Ananias, is executed along with his brother. So these rebels are really taking over now um, to avenge his father, the... Eleazar. Son Eleazar, uh, himself a rebel, then attacks Mahana and kills him. Eleazar then turns; he unites together all the rebels in Jerusalem, and they attack the three Roman towers. This goes back and forth for quite a while. It doesn't look like uh, any, either side is going to prevail, and so finally Eleazar makes a deal with Matilius, the commander of the Roman troops. We will let you leave. If you lay down your arms, we will let you leave, and you can go back to Caesarea. No one's going to hurt you. With that, the Romans agree. They lay down their arms, and they begin leaving Jerusalem when Eleazar sends his men in and slaughters them. Oh, no. According to Josephus, they all died, shouting out, the agreement, the agreement, the oath, the oath. And what's worse it was done on the Sabbath. Oh my God! This is this is how low things are getting. The Romans have been very slow at this point to react. You know, they, they got slaughtered at Masada. They got slaughtered now in in um, uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and now uh, Cestius Gallus, the, the big guy up in Antioch, decides he's going to have to do something serious. Um, other people were already taking events into their own hands. Gentiles in Caesarea had heard about what had happened to the uh, Roman troops in in, uh, Jerusalem. They reacted by having their own pogrom, uh, an an attack against the Jews, in which, according to Josephus, 20,000 Jews were massacred by the Gentiles. That's not unlikely, actually. The Jewish population in in Caesarea Maritana would have supported that kind of a slaughter. Wow. it also, at Scythopolis, um, some 13,000 were killed. In Alexandria, in Egypt, an untold number were killed, both by the Gentile population and by the Roman garrison there. They just went in and just slaughtered them because they were Jews because of what had happened in Jerusalem. Those numbers are just phenomenal. Oh, it, it, they are huge. They are. It's believed that as many as a million people died in this siege. This is one this of the most early. horrible. This is in 70. Oh yeah, my gosh. this is one of the most horrible events in uh, in ancient uh, ancient history. The the the, the siege of Absolutely. Jerusalem. Absolutely, that many people to oh. be killed. Oh because people had fled into the city. Mm-hmm. You know, and well, 
Uh, wow. Anyway, Celsius then Celsius takes his troops. He moves down to Galilee. There he joins with uh, King Agrippa, who's taking his his troops. Um, they then go off and first of all attack Joppa. Then they march through Galilee um, and um, uh, succeed in, in routing out a lot of the rep, um, the rebels there. Eventually. They make their way down to Jerusalem, and when they enter Jerusalem, they're ambushed. And finally, uh, the Romans then and their allies uh, retreat back with a loss of some 515 men uh, just from that. They sit outside of the gates of Jerusalem for some three days before they actually retreat. And there's great question as to why they did that. And um, Flavius Josephus claims that there was a, a prefect, a camp prefect, who had convinced um, uh, Gallus to stay and, and to continue trying. And his name is uh, uh, Tyrannius Priscus, and it's believed that he was in cahoots with Florus. The floors are still around, and the idea is, hey, we got the troops here. Let's go back and and mess up the city, you know. And but but uh, he's smart enough to know that that uh, he couldn't do this. During those three days, something very interesting thing is something very interesting happened. And what happened was that um, uh, Cestius Gallus decided to test the walls of Jerusalem. Now, they were very high and very thick, and he didn't have uh, artillery with him at the time. So what he decided instead was to mine them, see if you could dig down underneath them. But to do that, to send miners in, you've got to protect them. And there's a there's a Roman um, technique called a tortoise. And what it is is the Roman soldiers would go forward, and they have these, these big uh, rectangular um, shields called a scutum. And they would interlock the scutum up above their heads and then they would march up right to the wall itself and so you could shoot arrows down but you couldn't hit them or you could drop rocks down unless it was a big boulder you're not going to hurt these guys and then the miners would crawl underneath and through the legs of these soldiers and then they would begin digging underneath the um uh, underneath the, 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 wall. the wall. And this was a scary tactic for people inside, you know. Well, it, it was not effective. But on the other hand, it seemed as though it caused enough of a concern that a lot of people got out at this point. And this is what Flavius Josephus says. He says, and I quote here, panic now overcame the rebels, and many slipped out of the city thinking that it was on the verge of capture. It, this might have been the, one of the times, it, there are a couple different possible times when the Christian community was brought out of uh, Jerusalem, but that might have been uh, that time. But we're, we know for a fact that there were moments in which uh, people got out when they, when they could. Well, Cestius uh, finally gives up after three days. Uh, the Jerusalem walls are <laughs> they're built on, on a stone structure and this is a, uh, a stone hill mm -hmm. so that's not going to happen and he begins his retreat and while he's retreating um he got he got attacked by the rebels who had also set up an ambush <clears throat> and lost something like 5300 infantrymen and another 480 cavalry that's a lot. You know, 5,300 men was the size of an entire legion at that time. Wow. And, and we know the complete structure of a Roman, um, Roman legion, how it was broken up into cohorts and up into centuries. And we know that, you know, centurions and, and all of the, mm -hmm. the, the different officers and all. <clears throat> the, um, well, I, I don't want to get into that. I want to keep on moving. But the fact is that the uh, that Cestius then began retreating back up to Antioch. And as he did, that caused the Jews to begin to argue amongst themselves. That's when another bandit slipped in. His name is John of Geshala. And he brought in some 400 uh, Galileans. And these guys were um, these were bandits. Uh, they were bad, bad guys, and they had already had uh, running battles with Flavius Josephus, <clears throat> who is a historian, but before that he was a, a Jewish general. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Okay, and so he's trying to maintain some order up in that same area, and he's having run-ins with um, with John of Geshala. Um, finally, the the leadership of Jerusalem got together and said, "Hey, we better elect a real leader and pull this stuff together." And so Eleazar immediately thought he would be chosen because, after all, you know, well, he wasn't. He was he was passed over, and instead. They uh, they chose two individuals to um, uh, to oversee the um, the defense of the city. One of those was a man by the name of of Joseph, son of Gorion, and the other was an ex high priest, um, Ananos. They proposed sending throughout the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judea and recruiting in an army of a hundred thousand men. Wow, that is huge, and uh, it was impossible also, but that was their idea. The walls were strengthened, arms were prepared, troops were sent uh, out against uh, various uh, Jewish brigands. Nero's response, he was in Greece at the time, and when he received word of all of this, um, he sent this word back to Cestius. He said, and I quote here, These unpleasantries are due to poor generalship and not to the valor of the enemy. (laughs) So find the right general, we'll take care of it. (laughs) We'll fix it. Yeah, and he looked throughout the Roman Empire and he found a general. He found the general. This was Titus Flavius Vespasianus. He had been a victor. Uh, conqueror of Germany in Britain. He is then brought to Achaia in Greece. He joins the Emperor Nero. He gets his orders, and with that he went off to Antioch. He also sent his son down to Alexandria uh, to fetch the 15th Legion. He is going to introduce the Jews to the idea of shock and awe. Mm. (laughs) He's going to do it right. <clears throat> Meanwhile, things are looking all the worse for the the Jews. Um, they had sent a raiding, well, a significant uh, army, really, down to Ascalon, down in in Gal- uh, Galilee. I'm sorry, in in Gaza, and uh, there they met up with a really good Roman uh, commander, a man by the name of uh, Antonius. They lost 10,000 men in a battle with this guy, and then he turned around and he gave him another weapon. And, and they lost another 8,000 men. Vespasian then moves down, and he's coming slowly. He's doing it right. He joins uh, King Agrippa, uh, will join him. He moves on uh, Ptolemaeus, sending detachments uh, of some 7,000 men out to uh, Sepphoris, which is only 10 miles from Nazareth. You know, So we're talking about biblical hands yeah. here. You know? Titus arrives with his army, uh, his uh, legion, the 15th legion, which is joined to the 5th legion and the 10th legion. We also have King Agrippa now comes forward with some 2,000 troops plus the 2,000 cavalry that had run out of Jerusalem. Um, there are other allies, um, Antiochus, uh, Soemus, um, Malchus the Arab, who contributes some 5,000 men and another 1,000 uh, cavalry. So they're, um, they've got some big-time troops there. And he spends the year 67 just conquering Galilee. That's what all he wants to do is just take Gal- Galilee. And one of those um, uh, strong Jewish strongholds, is being held by none other than Flavius Josephus. And uh, this is at Jotapata. Now, Flavius says this about uh, Vespasian when he realizes that uh, he's he's, he's, um, going to have this battle. He says, Vespasian found this news a godsend for, uh, for Josephus. The man reputed to be the wisest among his enemies had thus imprisoned himself. In other words, he had, he had put himself into this um, uh, position where he couldn't retreat. Mm-hmm. But uh, you, you can see a little bit of <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> apple polishing yes, going right, on there. Exactly. Um, another <laughs> a quote from Josephus was this. He said, uh, uh, the Romans were struck with the ingenuity of Josephus. <laughs> Now, eventually, um, Jotapata fell in 67, in, in July of 67, and we have these words from um, 
from um, Josephus. I'd just like to read you a little section from the, the Gallic Wars. He's talking here particularly about Titus. Okay. So Josephus uh, is captured or he surrenders, depending on your whoever's telling the story. <laughs> and he goes to the Roman camp and he impresses the Romans so much that they bring him on as as a um as a historian. Okay. This and part of this is because of what he says here. He says this. He says Titus in particular was struck by Josephus' nobility in misfortune. And Titus' intercession with his father was the main reason the prisoner was spared. Vespasian ordered that he be closely guarded, however, intending to send him to Nero. <clears throat> Josephus asked for a private interview with Vespasian, and all withdrew except Titus and two of his friends. You think, Vespasian, Josephus said, I remember Josephus is writing this, yes, okay, that's... <laughs> that you have a mere captive in Josephus, but... I come to you as a messenger of a greater destiny. Why send me to Nero? Do you think that he will continue in office? You, Vespasian, will be Caesar and emperor. You and your son here, for you are master not only of me, but of sea and land and the whole human race. Oh, oh. Boy. He, he was a sufficient brown noser, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so that's one way to get a job. That's right. <laughs> Save that neck, anyway. Save that neck, yeah. <laughs> and then from there, they continue to mop up uh, operation in the Galilee area. Uh, the Romans then attacked uh, the, the the port city or the uh, the uh, um, seaside city of um, Tarachi AA, which is actually Magdala. Oh. It used to be called Magdala. Um, Gamela falls to them. Uh, Gashala falls to them. John of Gashala's hometown. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, everything is a mess in Jerusalem itself. They are not preparing for this defense. Um, what you have is um, Ananus, the uh, former high priest. He's a moderate leader just trying to save the city. Um, Eleazar, the son of the uh, other Ananias uh, mm -hmm. high priest, he is a zealot leader. He has also taken control of the temple treasury. Uh, John of Sh uh, Gashala is still running around. Uh, he's trying to get control over the zealots with his bandits. Then you have uh, Simon, the uh, son of Gorias. He's gone out of the city and gone into the countryside trying to get provisions together, get recruits. So at least he's trying to do something. Then add to this, there's a bunch of professional soldiers that come up from Idiomea, which um, that's the region that Herod originally was from. Okay. Some 20,000 of them come in, and the zealots open the gates to let them in. Um, at this point, you have the chief priest, Ananus, also murdered. His body is then thrown down over the uh, the walls and, and is allowed to rot. Th that's a horrible thing for a Jew. You know, and, and so his body is just set out there. Um, there are some 12,000 Jewish young noble boys and, and young men who are attacked by these zealots because they had been uh, part of that moderate group. 12,000 of them killed by fellow Jews. So they're just going at each other. You know, uh, The zealots attack uh, John, the son of Goria, who then flees himself. Um, and, and he takes his little army and goes down and attacks Idiomea, where the Idiomean troops are up in Jerusalem. The um, This just goes on and on. Uh, let me read you again another observation. Uh, this is from uh, Flavius Josephus, The okay. Jewish Wars. Uh, this is book four. And uh, he, he, this is the state of affairs, okay, in, 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 in Jerusalem, in the area. He says, Simon, the son of Goria, now marched to Jerusalem and again camped outside its walls, killing any he caught uh, going out into the country. The citizens thus found Simon outside more formidable than the Romans, and the zealots inside more oppressive than either. The Galilean contingent among the zealots who had uh, raised John of Geshala to power were allowed by him to commit every excess. They looted the homes of the wealthy, murdered men, violated women, and assumed the dress as well as the passions of women. 
this is a very interesting thing. Like, keep that in mind. Um, devising illegal pleasures and polluting the entire city. Those who fled the tyranny of John were massacred by Simon. So there was no escape. At that point, there's no escape. So there's there's the situation in, in, in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, this, right at the time when uh, when Vespasian's armies are just beginning to come, and then all of a sudden they stop. The Romans stop it dead in their tracks. And the reason is that on June 6th of 68 AD, Nero committed suicide. He did it right before he was about to be murdered. Oh. Okay, now there's no emperor. At this point, you go through three different emperors. There, there's, uh, there are three people who... Um, uh, Galba, Otho, and Vitalis uh, all try to take control. And ultimately, uh, it's Vespasian who is going to win the day. And he is going to go back to Rome. He will restore order only after his brother, Sabinus, was murdered. His brother was the prefect of Rome and was murdered by one of these pretenders. Um, he then goes back, and now Titus takes over the siege. Okay. Okay. Now, within Jerusalem, as the Romans begin now to surround Jerusalem again, uh, you have three factions. Eleazar, and he's, he's in control of the temple courtyards. Okay. Mm -hmm. John of Gashala, he's roaming all over the city, and he attacks the temple precincts every once in a while, but he's not able to get in. And then you've got Simon, the son of Goria, who's uh, holding the outer outside the countryside but then when the romans arrive he's got to get inside too mm -hmm. so he sneaks in and takes over the upper and lower parts of the city okay okay um i think this would be a, a good time to say something about um uh, the, uh, the clock yes okay and uh what you what you have, it, imagine Jerusalem. This is not a perfect example, but it, it gives us. I think it helps us a bit. Okay, uh, what you have is look at a clock, and if you were to think in terms of one o'clock and two o'clock, okay, that there you would have the the pool of Bethsaida is located in that area. Go to three o'clock, and Temple Mount is there. Okay. Now, if you go three o'clock on your on your clock, and then you move out. Uh, from that, you have the Kidron Valley, and beyond that, the Mount of Olives. That's where the 10th Legion is firing off that Belista, uh, uh -huh. okay, toward the city. Four o'clock and five o'clock are the lower city, and the, and the Pool of Siloam is there. Between six and seven o'clock is the Essene Gate, and that's going to become important later on the next time we get together. And then um, eight and nine o'clock is the upper city, and 10 o'clock is the new quarters. Those, that's the area where John, of, of Gish, uh, son of Gishala, is, is putting himself in. Okay. They're all attacking each other. In Jerusalem, there was enough grain to last for years. They were destroying each other's food supplies. It, oh, this is crazy. And so that's when Titus then closes the noose around Jerusalem, brings in the 12th legion, which I mentioned before before our program. We're this is an exciting, yeah, it's yeah. an exciting legion. But anyway, they came in, and then let's get it gets worse. Okay, it it all comes about on, on Passover of 70 A.D. Wow, Eleazar admits worshipers to the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. So many Jews who had been out in the countryside in Judea, instead of doing what Luke's Gospel said, to go to the out. mountains, uh -huh. instead they rushed into mm. the Jerusalem in order to celebrate this feast. And that's why the population swelled so badly oh. as a result. Well, on May 10th of 70 A.D., the siege got underway. And defending the city was John of of um, of uh, uh, the son of of, uh, Gish, of uh, Giora, okay, and oh. he had ten thousand men. The Idumeans had about five thousand men. Um, then you had um, John of Gashala. He has around six thousand men, and then also he's added some twenty four hundred men from Eleazar, who he had murdered. Now, I just want to. Real fast, go to Matthew uh, 24, the 24th um, chapter of Matthew's Gospel, and listen to this bit by bit. Okay, this is the 24th chapter, uh, the first verse. 
and Jesus left the temple area and was going away when his disciples approached him to point out the temple buildings. And he said in reply, You see all this, all these things, do you not? Amen, I say to you, there will not be left here a stone upon a stone that will not be thrown down. The third verse. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will this happen? That's the Mount of Olives. That's where the Tenth Legion is. That's where they're firing off the sun, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The fifth verse. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. That's exactly what these rebels were doing. Uh, Seventh verse. Nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes from place to place. Famines, that's exactly what's going to take place in Jerusalem. So much so that there's a case in which one woman actually roasted her baby. Yeah, it, this is this is incredible, terrible. The tenth, uh, tenth uh, verse, and then many will be led into sin, and they will betray and hate one another. That's exactly um, what what these Galileans did, cross dressing, you know. And then uh, finally, you get mm. to the fourteenth verse, and it says here, and this gospel, gospel of the kingdom will be will be. Um, preached throughout the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So there, right there in Matthew's Gospel, in the 24th verse, you have a, a verse-by-verse description of the, the horrors of, of what takes place with this. So part of the opening attack is going to be this barrage of large stones. And now, we, we spent this hour talking about this. You can see the incredible arrogance of these Jewish watchmen who are shouting out, oh, the sun is coming. Right. Uh, right. The son of God is coming. Wow. And, and there are no Christians around. They are not there. Instead, they're mocking a group that had left Jerusalem already. Mm-hmm. Left it to partake in its own sin and its own carnage, and in uh, and, and its own mockery. The Christians weren't around because they knew to get out. And next time around, we're going to give you a pretty good idea where they went. Oh, great! Yeah, wonderful, Father. Great show, and I love listening to the Gospel of Matthew and knowing what that was talking about there. <laughs> more. That was great, and so our. Our title today was Here Comes the Sun, the Siege of Jerusalem, 70 AD. And next next time we'll be talking about the rapture in Pella. Rapture in Pella. Where do these guys go? Yeah. Shall we close with a prayer and okay. blessing? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it, it was, was in the, the beginning, beginning, is now, now and ever shall, shall be. be. World, world without, without end. end. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.